Na koto tina koto tina tato kato no my hari my hello everybody and welcome to the EHF Impact Springboard leading innovation for global impact. In this session, we are going to be exploring together emerging models, regenerative and blended finance. So get comfortable because it will be a great one for the next hour. My name is Michelle Parker and I am the Head of Fellowship Experience at the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. We will open this session with a karakia. Po hihiri, po rarama, po o te whakaro, po o te tangata, po o te aroha, te po e hiri nei i a tātou, mauri ora ki a tātou, humi e, hui e, pai ki e. So it's wonderful to have all of you here with us. Um, we have a mix of people from all over um, the world and Aotearoa New Zealand with people from public and private sector, the innovation ecosystem, and of course our Edmund Hillary Fellows, who it's always lovely to see online. These um, sessions here are, have been running over four days uh, this week and with the purpose of connecting Aotearoa New Zealand with our EHF fellows, Hillary laureates and more key leaders around critical challenges and opportunities for Aotearoa New Zealand. So we have a panel of three incredible EHF fellows and they will each have a moment to provide some of their insights on this topic and then open up for Q&A afterwards. And I will have and over to uh, our panel moderator for the, today, um, who is Rosalie, our CEO for the Hillary Institute and the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Kia ora, Rosalie. Uh, kia ora, enga mana, enga reo, enga rorangatira ma, ki te mana whenua, tēnā koto, ko ta Edmund Hillary, te tangata, ko Edmund Hillary Fellowship, te whare, ko Rosalie Nelson, tōku ingoa, Modi order. Look, thank you all so much for joining us um, from all over the world for this important discussion on regenerative and blended finance. Um, and this is a sharing of a new initiative uh, from Edmund Hillary Fellows, a climate impact fund for Asia Pacific Islands for communitarian projects. Now, for those of you that may not be so familiar with the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, we are a community of over 500 innovators, entrepreneurs and investors who are committed to Aotearoa New Zealand as a base camp for global impact. And we are joined, I'm just so delighted to be able to introduce our three speakers today. We have Satya Dontansetti, Vishal Chada, Chada and Sid Stalika. And I was trying to practice beforehand, haven't quite got those right yet, who are part of a group of fellows who are absolutely passionate about bringing new models of collaboration and finance to drive systems change with a real focus on climate action. Um, just one thing to stress, this is very much a new initiative. Um, so the desire here is to share the initial thinking and to invite participation and support to continue to shape this project. Um, look, we are going to be introducing what may be some new terms for some of you here. So just to give a couple of definitions up front, regenerative finance uh, might be defined as an alternative financial system that promotes and restores environmental, social and financial stability alongside monetary gains. And it's often using innovative technologies and tools and, and sometimes as a pride in the era of cryptocurrency. Blended finance combines concessional finance, in other words, loans that are extended on more general terms than market loans and alongside commercial funding. And what it effectively allows investors to do is to choose different risk tolerances while all are participating in the same project. What I'm going to do is introduce each speaker in turn who will share their particular aspect of the project and then we'll open up for questions from the floor. And please don't hesitate to ask if we do inadvertently slip into jargon through this process. Uh, look, to share the big idea and how it came about, um, I want to invite Sanya Dontansetti. He's a Quandam entrepreneur and he's, he's had over 30 years 
as an entrepreneur primarily dedicated to clean energy and renewables, uh, having commenced, commenced with a short stint in the oil and gas industry. Satya was driven by climate change imperatives and he found incubation support from the World Bank under the photovoltaic market transformation initiative in 2000, much before solar became mainstream. So Sid, I'll hand over to you to kick off. Thank you, Rosalie. Greetings from India and namaste. Firstly, um, thanks, for, uh, thanks to EHF for organizing it at a better time. I'm not uh, at my screen at 5.30 in the morning, which is usually the case for uh, EHF sessions. Um, and then I also want to express my uh, gratitude for being part of this fellowship. I have met some wonderful people uh, as a part of this fellowship. And uh, here, um, you know, what, we are, uh, what we are trying to do, I will explain. And uh, um, you know, basically, uh, I have, um, we have put together what uh, the amazing fellows doing uh, incredible things. And here, the idea is connecting them all together. And this started with uh, EHF in uh, early 2023, embarking on a new ex expedition and setting climate innovation as the grand first grand challenge. And uh, to solve the systemic climate challenges in New Zealand and the Pacific through radical collaborations. This was inspiring and I was excited. This is, New Zealand's destiny, this is EHF destiny and my destiny all together. So uh, what, what, is, what is the big idea? What is uh, climate, uh, climate Fund? It's a climate impact fund which has New Zealand as a base camp inspired by Sir Edmund Hillary. The fund will focus on the island nations of Asia Pacific that are most vulnerable to climate change. And there are several barriers to providing climate finance for these countries. We, we will invest across uh, climate mitigation, adaptation, regenerative agriculture, and oceans. We champion communitarian climate projects backed by on-chain social fabric with a game-changing Impact Hive model by Andrew Hewitt and community focused neighborhoods Web3 platform by Sid. And we are purpose driven using blended concessional finance, which combines public, private, philanthropic funds for achieving SDGs and climate action. Now that sounds a lot. Uh, and we will unpack it in the next 15 minutes for you. Don't worry. So, how did this all come about? You know, uh, as I was saying, we started with our welcome experience and there, that is where we learned the indigenous wisdom of Maori. It was Mike Kerry who explained the Maori creation story. And then I realized what is the deep uh, connect and kinship they have with nature. And, you know, we came to know about they are Maori and Kaitia Kitanga, stewardship of land and oceans. So uh, with that and meeting these uh, incredible people, I was there, Sid is there, Andrew. Um, so, uh, you know, in this, um, uh, after the welcome experience, we had um, a session in the BNZ Center in Wellington. And that's where Andrew introduced about uh, the little about the impact hive. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but he talked about raising funds from philanthropic sources for, uh, you know, the mission studio, which was launched by uh, EHF. And he had done that for a hundred million dollar uh, SDG impact fund. And this was exciting. So uh, next, um, Sid, if you could, yeah. So after this, um, just like uh, 
you know, World Bank was having a climate innovation conference called Innovate for Climate in Bilbao. Spain is the antipod of New Zealand, right across the earth on the other side. So, yeah, this was, uh, uh, you know, good to go there and connect. And I wanted to see about organizing a similar climate innovation conference in uh, New Zealand. So the fellow you see here is uh, uh, my friend in um, uh, Bilbao. Um, he has an incredible project. Uh, he's made a bicycle with wood composites from the Basque forest. And thanks to my visit there, uh, he is now collaborating with a Kiwi company, Kiwi Fiber, uh, and um, uh, making a bicycle wheel rim out of Harakiki. So I think I owe it to uh, Mark uh, Bregman for talking about biocomposites and their potential. So this collaboration came that way. And uh, I attended the IFC session on blended finance. So that was... Um, where I connected with my old friends in uh, IFC. You see Vikram Vich there. Uh, he uh, funded me from IFC uh, more than 25 years ago. Uh, and what I got for my project, Photovoltaic Market Transformation Initiative, uh, that was also blended finance in those days. So uh, this was, uh, you know, uh, so exciting that they're using blended finance in a limited way uh, for country funds. And I was excited. I was sharing these screens by WhatsApp to Andrew Hewitt or, you know, that, and uh, connecting it with the model that he proposed with donor advice funds. We will talk about that later more. Um, next was the Seeds Impact Conference by Stephen Moe. This is where you got all the co-conspirators together, Rosalie. And uh, uh, here, my think, uh, you know, thoughts were uh, synthesized and uh, the uh, theme of the conference really resonated with me. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And then we know about COP and Paris Agreement and then you know, the, the uh, uh, climate finance that is required for the Pacific, but we don't know our way around the Pacific. We don't have a WACA. And that's where uh, we have a, a wayfinding strategist in, in our fellowship. And Pomina uh, gave the support and, uh, you know, agreed to be part of the team. And there was also, it was also very um, encouraging to get the uh, collaboration from Kaimeri done. So next, uh, you know, Sid was doing this project in Sri Lanka. He will, uh, Neighborhoods Foundation is our anchor for the proposed idea of Climate Fund. Sid will talk about neighborhoods, but let me say one thing about Sid. Um, some uh, things that not many people know. Sid was, is from uh, MBA from a topmost uh, institute in India, and he was an options trader. But post-2008 um, financial crisis, Sid quit, quit it all and then went to Gandhi's ashram in Sabarmati, very close to his alma mater, and detoxed himself. And he vowed to build a new uh, global financial system that will support community-led projects. And that was very inspiring. And Sid, was, Sid and I were sharing rooms in... Uh, uh, during the welcome uh, experience. So, uh, you know, Sid will talk more about it. <clears throat> so he is in this new avatar after being an uh, options trader. And uh, looks like uh, Gandhi's philosophy has imbibed in him. And, uh, you know, so we will, you will hear more about that. And again, briefly about Andrew's... Uh, efforts, he has been working on the impact hive model, which I feel is very ideal uh, fit for uh, uh, EHF. And the impact hive model, basically, you bring these experts, investors, and uh, uh, innovators together. And 
you know, uh, create true synergies, uh, which help solve complex problems. And he has been working on this from 2017 and more particularly in the last uh, uh, three years. And he is a real game changer. So we will talk more about that uh, later. Um, so then, you know, there was an opportunity for an RFP uh, from uh, MFAT in uh, October, November. Amy um, brought that to our attention, but we could not uh, participate in that because of uh, lack of time. And then came along uh, this, uh, you know, opportunity from Climate Policy Initiative, the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance, looking at uh, new models and all these things which happened over a year, it got connected. And then, you know, the idea uh, came about. It's like, uh, since we are talking about Pacific, it was like stringing the Pacific pearls together. And then we, uh, you know, developed uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, Climate Fund. And now Vishal will talk uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the fund design. Great, thank you, Satya. And look, it's so it's always so encouraging to see the way that all of these different points of interconnection have come uh, together and really catalyzed something. So, look to talk about the climate from climate fund preliminary design. And uh, to really think about what this could look like, um, we're joined by Vishal Chada. So Vishal's been an investor and advisor in early stage startups for the last decade in India and in New Zealand. And he's absolutely passionate about leveraging technology for impact and to solve some of the hard problems that the world faces. Uh, he's been a two times entrepreneur. He co-founded a technology company in India and has run several board mandates, including being on a board that successfully led an IPO in 2019. He did spend the first two decades of his career in uh, operating roles in consumer and consumer technology companies and now regularly works with public institutions and universities on their startup programs. Vishal, thank you. Yeah, thanks Rosalie and Kira everyone. Thanks for coming to the session. So lovely to see all uh, familiar and new faces. Uh, just a quick personal note my side as well. Ever since I came to the fellowship back in 2020, I've been sort of hugely inspired by seeing several fellows chipping away on the climate agenda. Uh, and I'm new to this mission, but uh, I've been inspired enough, uh, you know, to think how I can possibly bring in my own skills and background um, in venture building to do more around climate action. And I guess one of the most uh, significant inspirations uh, in the recent months was being part of the Climate Action Group um, and seeing everyone collaborate there and particularly Satya with his infectious energy and stubborn optimism almost in pushing for uh, CPI lab participation and wider climate action in the fellowships. And I genuinely feel uh, that what we are trying here could be, I want to say, a great template for uh, more action bias in the fellowship on several of the impact goals that we might be passionate about. So yeah, with that little thank you from my side, just jumping into the slides, Sid, if you can go to the next one. Um, this is just to contextualize the Climap initiative a bit more for all of you. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the weeds on the numbers and jargon, but just bear with me. Uh, we all know COP28 finished uh, recently. And one of the high level expert groups uh, with backgrounds in economics, international finance, banking, was tasked with uh, this idea of assessing how financial systems and models uh, really need to change uh, to deliver on the Paris Agreement. And what you see here on the right-hand side is a report, but really the headline was, uh, and you know, we can put the report in the show notes for those who might be interested, that emerging markets and developing countries need something like a 4X from where they are as far as current climate finance into these countries is concerned. Uh, from a $600 billion, it's almost like a $2.4 trillion that's needed. And that's a steep ask by itself. Uh, and Sid, if you go to the next one, just to peel that a little further, 
blended finance has emerged as possibly the scarcest and the most you know vital component in this incremental that's needed it's just not a key component but it's also a component that needs to grow at the fastest pace in the next five to six years and that sort of reinforced our uh, you know thinking around uh, stakeholders need to work harder on the whole concept of blended finance and like me if some of you are new to this term rosalie spoke about uh, blended finance a bit but on the next slide, just to explain the concept uh, in a bit more detail, it's essentially uh, a way to create uh, models that allow development funding and private capital to participate in the same goals, where development finance is operating on concessional rates, sometimes using philanthropy uh, or grant money, and private capital is actually on market or near market rate of return expectations. Uh, but I think the most important thing that emerged out of that work that the experts did and what everyone is hearing is that the institutions that matter, be it the countries, the private sector, the MDBs, donors, philanthropists, they all need to uh, sort of collaborate much harder, much deeper. Uh, no one can just do it alone. And there's a serious need to sort of align goals, motivations, and incentives uh, in the right blending. And frankly, that requires a lot of fresh thinking, a lot of innovation using technology, using new structures on how value is measured, how impact is tracked, what's the governance behind all this, and to really ensure there's equitable outcomes for all the actors who are involved. And this is frankly where the penny dropped for us, you know, when we used to be discussing about these ideas. Uh, and the second peg for Climap really came when we realized that, wait a minute, just within the fellowship, if you look around, there is so much a body of work already done by some of the fellows. And, you know, to name a few, Satya spoke about Andrew's work on Impact Hive, Sid's going to talk about neighborhoods today and tomorrow in a session. Uh, and we realized that these could, you know, very well become such crucial scaffolding as we try and mount the idea of a climate fund. Um, and, you know, it's something which can allow um, experts and advisors on one side, side to stay focused and communitarian impact on the other side. So that was a big aha moment for us. Uh, and if you go down one more slide, Sid, um, as we went and socialized the idea a bit more in the fellowship, we sort of rediscovered the third and probably uh, the most critical peg to mount the idea on. Uh, and this is where I truly feel that we are blessed to be part of the fellowship in, in, in the fact that so many fellows have been chipping away on climate action goals in, in their own small way. And what you see here on this slide is a brilliant repository of uh, fellow-led projects and a big thank you to the EHF Central team to actually put all of this together. Frankly, it blew my mind when I saw this. Um, and in the run-up to today, in the last two, three months, We've had some really encouraging and amazing conversations with fellows listed here. I mean, I would just, I, I see uh, Mike in the room, but Nat and Mike doing some work on nature restoration, which is in New Zealand right now, but could have sort of good learnings for the Pacific or Dr. Brian's work on marine permaculture or the work Amy is doing on more resilient South Pacific communities. And almost everyone uh, equivocally felt that this is such a powerful base of projects to start engaging with for the fund. And look, we're conscious that not everything uh, here will fit into the eventual fund thesis, uh, but what it gives us is a great start point for some real grassroots communitarian work, which is happening, something that private capital would truly, truly value, I feel. And with that, I would come into uh, the last slide that I really wanted to put up uh, just to bring everything together and said, if you can go down, um, there's a bit of animation on this slide, but just to bring everything operationally, like if you're trying to set up a fund, what does the scaffold start to look like? This is really version one. Uh, so a caution there, actually maybe even version 0 0.5. But as a first step on your left is of course, we need to start mapping the various sources of finance that could in some way be focused on the island economies in the Pacific or Asia Pacific. Uh, here, it would be super useful uh, if any one of you has networks that you wanna open up to us. Uh, the deployment of the fund would be across a couple of different areas. One of course is the venture companies, uh, 
uh, the, the projects itself. And there, though, we have a base of EHF projects to start with. If you know entrepreneurs who are sort of working hard in the Pacific or Asia Pacific island economies and climate, feel free to open that up to us. And most importantly, we want to bring in some capital and thinking into building the right support structure to get these uh, ventures to succeed. It's sort of a venture studio approach where we would really like to tap into the collective intelligence uh, which exists in the EHF network and the extended network to make these ventures succeed. And I think a key component would be in this approach to use tools uh, which we fortunately already have within the network uh, we spoke about impact hive and neighborhoods as I think those will really help uh, align the right reward structures for something like this to succeed and all stakeholders to be interested. And I think this would be a good segue for me to pause and bring in Sid to talk a bit about neighborhoods, which is one of the anchor points that we are looking for uh, the fund itself. Yeah, Sid, over to you. I'll I'll just perhaps give a bit of framing for for Sid Stalika. Yeah, sure. So Sid's experience spans both ends of the economic spectrum, uh, from heading South Asia's largest trading desk to exploring and designing distributed economic paradigms, um, as uh, Satya had mentioned in the Gandhi Ashram in India. He is the founder and chair of the Neighborhoods Foundation, and this is a Web3 project that's headed in uh, headquartered in New Zealand, and the toolkit enables new social coordination patterns, so communities and micro-networks can leverage distributed ledgers to record culturally relevant information with which they can better orchestrate their activities. Uh, so SIT's hope is to eventually enable ground up communitarian responses to some of the major crises we face as a society. So SID, having given that framework for you, just love to hear more about your work in the space. Thank you. Um, I feel like you've already described neighborhoods well, so it's job done. Um, just real quick, Paula, I've, if we're running tight in time or oh, Michelle, I can probably keep this short. Um, for those who are interested, we have a more detailed conversation uh, between Camilla and me about neighborhoods tomorrow. Um, so I'll keep this down to just a couple of minutes um, more about how neighborhoods enables projects like uh, Climap. Um, I think the short answer is um, Vishal spoke about the blended finance side, like the source of funds and how more patient and multidimensional and, and more broader perspective capital can engage better with some of these regions that we're talking about. Um, I feel like projects like Neighborhoods and Impact Hive enable this capital to land in a more wholesome, sustainable way in these communities. Because as we've seen in the past, often um, capital when invested in some of these regions can be quite extractive uh, and even destructive to some of the social fabric um, in these communities. Um, but projects like these leverage new break breakthroughs in technology like Web3, like distributed ledger technology, like peer-to-peer -peer ne networks to ensure a stronger communitarian response. So it effectively allows communities to come together, organize themselves better, so that when capital lands in within them, it, it actually results in a much more wholesome response, empowering the community as opposed to simply extracting from it. Um, and so in effect, it we when we looked at technologies like Web3, we said these are important because they allow communities to have agency in the way in which they store and validate information, allowing them to deploy their own networks in a very simple and easy way without having to resort to institutions like either governments or large Web2 platforms, which have typically maintained information for, com for, for communities. And so this information could be varied. It could be, you know, a community saying we value time contributed in our community garden, or it could be what kinds of regenerative agriculture practices are we taking on, or more commercial, like who, you know, transactions and payments and loans repaid, or even social in terms of like who is 
showing up for the community more. Um, and, and this gets stored. And, and so neighborhoods infrastructure allows communities to store this um, in a simple and easy way, in a, in a way in which they, in, they can deploy these toolkits without any code experience, almost like a drag and drop way. It also allows communities to express preferences and prioritize action um, to, to specify which kind of behavior gets amplified um, and this is a stark contrast in stark contrast to what we see today, where if a community wants to operate on a pl platform, say like Facebook, you actually don't have that option. It's it's predetermined, and so it's almost like the platform's culture overriding the local community's culture. Uh, and lastly, it also you know these technologies allow these communities to articulate what rules or what governance um, defines how they evolve um, and work with each other and across communities. Um, I won't go too much into these details, but these snapshots just give you a gist of how these technologies allow communities to put together these spaces for themselves. Um, and the role of neighborhoods is just accelerating it or making it easier. Um, but really quick, I'll probably wrap up in, in a minute or two uh, from here. Um, some of the pilot projects that we're working with um, are, I would say, threefold. There's, there's local projects. Uh, on ground communities that we're enabling there's global capital you know projects like climap but there's also bridges which allow for um, a translation of efforts on the ground into a language that is understood by global capital um, and so one of the projects we're partnering with is called the zero degree collaboratory which is basically a form of climate accounting which validates contributions made by young people in local communities um, and translates it into um, a quote unquote net cooling effect on the planet. So you might have you know, a community in Hawaii or, or Sri Lanka or in New Zealand where a group of students might take on a local activity like maybe cleaning the beach or installing some kind of solar panels or a solar kitchen. Um, but this particular project, the Zero Degree Collaboratory translates that into a net impact in, so in helping to solve the climate crisis. Uh, and this is possible because these communities will store and validate and audit this information in their own community deployed ledgers, which allows this information to flow across communities as well as into projects like Climap, which would then have this data on chain in an, in a, through via an auditable trail, which would then allow them to make funding decisions and so these funding decisions could be micro investments in entrepreneurs um, taking on social enterprises. They could be grants. They could be dynamic credit limits that are issued to people in these communities if they're you know, practicing agriculture, for example, in a particular way. Um, the spectrum is quite broad and varied. Um, and, and lastly, a lot of these pilot projects are just local communities that we're working with. Satya mentioned one of them in in a, re in a region in Sri Lanka, which is about 1.2 million people, where um, there's an intention to regen to to revitalize regenerative agriculture farm practices, but in in a way in which information is stored and recorded on distributed ledgers uh, through projects like neighborhoods, and so projects like these allow us projects like ours allow us to validate um, specific practices like maintaining diversity in in the seeds that are used or practicing certain kinds of organic farming or track people who are contributing and tracking species diversity and allow for the flow of capital from from global blended finance into these communities in a way in which it circulates and rege is regenerative as opposed to simply extractive and distorting social fabric. Um, but I'll stop at that. Like I said, more of this tomorrow um, for those who Stitch, would thank like to you. that session. Thank you um, so thank much. You. Um, look, we know that there's a lot of questions that we've raised through this. So please do, don't hesitate to put your questions into chat. Um, 
also if you've got uh, comments also keen to see those but if you're specifically putting a question please ensure that it's clearly marked as a question there's a couple of things that um, from what we've heard that I just wanted to ask for a little bit of clarity on when we're talking about climate investing in communitarian projects what does that actually mean does it mean that you're only going to be investing in community-led projects or will there be individual businesses just like to unpack that framing a little more do either of you vishal do you want to take it no oh. Yeah. Uh, Whoever yeah. wants to jump in. <laughs> no, I can take that, Rosalie. Uh, actually, uh, it's so early in the in the whole planning cycle that we haven't really um, gone into those uh, specifics about the fund and the fund thesis. But yeah, at a very high level, we uh, would always be conscious of looking at projects which have uh, community as a big part of them. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, in these uh, Pacific and island economies, uh, you can only be successful uh, if you have your ear to the ground and take the community along with you in the project. Uh, so that's definitely going to be a cornerstone of how we are going to be looking at it, for sure. I'll, just real quick, I can add, I think some of these technologies and toolkits are so new, with, we're starting to figure out how they will land with, with, with different regions. And so it's quite likely that I'm just riffing here, Climap might invest in projects and enterprises which end up becoming more co-op style operating and, 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 and owned because these technologies allow, you know, structures like enterprises to become more cooperative. And simultaneously within communities, it might allow a group to come together and set up a social enterprise, like an actual business within the community, which is now investor, investor worthy because a lot of their data is formalized and on chain. So it could be it could be both ways. Thank if you. I may got a great add, uh, you know, it would uh, the projects would uh, include uh, climate mitigation projects like uh, solar, wind, distributed solar, um, and. Uh, you know, regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions like uh, seaweed marine permaculture of uh, Dr. Brian Juan Herzen. I think things like that, yeah. There's a great question from Camille. Uh, and I think this goes to, um, ties into the concept of the impact hive. Camille's question is, have you thought about a governance structure for this fund and how are other blended finance funds governed? you want to talk about the impact hive uh, this yeah i can first talk about the uh, Im impact hive and then probably vishal you can talk about the governance structure and uh, so uh, the impact hive is interesting uh, because andrew designed something over the years working for uh, uh, fetzer institute and it is about uh, conscious capitalism and trying to create an econ economy based on love. Moving from win-lose kind of a, a business to a win-for-all uh, model. So the ecosystem of experts, creators, innovators, and nonprofits that we have in uh, EHF uh, you know, is an ideal fit because it allows uh, collaboration rather than competition and uh, develop some uh, true synergies so that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And this really improves the chances of uh, success for solving uh, complex problems like you know, climate solutions. So uh, the Impact Hive will have several USPs to raise funds from philanthropic sources. And um, this, this catalytic capital can be distributed between the startups in the Impact Hive, the non nonprofits, and the experts also to provide advisory services to the uh, fund. These experts are people you cannot hire and people who will be able to give critical mentorship and uh, ideas and provide their network for the startups. So all that is possible under the Impact Hive. And here, you know, the rewards are also distributed wi widely, not equally. It's, it's not socialism. It's, I would say, conscious capitalism. And where you know, 
uh, we are all part of this community. It's like a sort of a guild. And our common purpose is address the climate emergency and the SDGs uh, and uh, climate action. So if, with that uh, brief uh, uh, impact hive, Andrew would have done a much better job. He's a very good communicator, but I would uh, now ask uh, uh, Vishal to cover about the governance structure. Yeah, Satya, thanks. I think you touched upon it. So essentially, there will be uh, a GP governance structure eventually in the fund, which would uh, be responsible for day-to-day -day operations of the fund. But structurally, the big difference, I feel, uh, would be in terms of all the neighborhood and impact type models that we are thinking about and how uh, rewards and motivations are going to get aligned there. And of course, at, at the core of that would be to tap into the uh, EHF network of advisors um, and, and try and see how those uh, networks can also be aligned to the same sort of goals. Uh, so uh, effectively that becomes the model. There is a venture studio approach which is being looked at, which is gonna lean on a lot of these skill sets. Um, and each of these uh, sort of uh, ventures would be put through that venture studio approach uh, towards success. Can I just really quickly add a personal uh, reflection here? Uh, having worked with, uh, just, you know, been part of conversations about, uh, about the Climate Fund the last couple of months, um, it's been really refreshing to see Satya anchoring these values himself. It's mm -hmm. never seemed like a control thing for him. Like he's constantly held that ethos and value system of yeah we have to be as collaborative as possible in this and i really really appreciate how he embodies that just in terms of the complete lack of ego that he uh, operates out of that's all mm -hmm. thanks there's a really interesting question from robert o'brien um it, it might be a little early to go into it but how do you think the regulatory landscape in new zealand or elsewhere should evolve to better support these types of investment approaches, blended, catalytic, or regenerative? Yeah, I think Rosalie, you said it correct. It's probably a little early for us to have thought through this. Uh, we know for a fact that there is uh, some ministries in New Zealand who actually have funds earmarked uh, towards the Pacific Island uh, so I guess the only thing when you start blending in private capital with uh, sovereign or public money would be uh, just the ease of the processes and how sort of flexible can that be uh, towards mm -hmm. achieving some of these objectives. Because what one is realizing is that a lot of public money comes anchored with a lot of mm -hmm. do's and don'ts. And that's where it starts getting extremely challenging uh, in terms of putting these structures together. So. I don't have a specific point to say uh, for New Zealand, but this would be my just general comment on it. Thank you. There's a really good point from um, one of our fellows, Amy Armstrong here, who's uh, given thanks for the overview and the enthusiasm and the efforts. She makes a point that there's some evidence that other blended finance facilities, Blue Nature Capital Facility, Global Fund for Coral Reefs, et cetera, they've overestimated the pipeline of revenue generating ventures on the ground and have needed to pivot to capacity building efforts. So in other words, they've needed to focus on building the absorptive capacity in communities. So I guess the question is, how are you thinking about ground truthing assumptions about the venture pipeline in the island communities where you are hoping uh, to partner? Uh, can I have a go at that? Yeah, uh, so there are uh, several things happening here. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very um, encouraging to see New Zealand take leadership in this. MFAT has uh, an RFP uh, for building capacity uh, in 15 Pacific uh, Islands, uh, $25 million for this effort. Uh, apart from this, uh, MFAT is also uh, launching a blended finance fund uh, through a, a, a fund manager. It's about $50 million for which New Zealand is contributing uh, $10 million. Uh, and uh, uh, similarly, um, 
I mean, I think the MFAD budget for um, uh, funding projects in the Pacific Islands itself is about 1.2 billion in the next uh, two years. So that's, I, I, in fact, a lot of this money, uh, uh, Amy is right, that you know because of lack of capacity in 10 of those uh, 15 countries, it's only capacity building, not the flexible finance that they're offering. So it's an important point. That's where I think uh, uh, you know working with the communities, and that's where the nonprofits in the uh, impact high will play this impact uh, important role. And we have this model of the regenerative income uh, being a constant source of funding for the nonprofits in the impact high. Thank you. Um, how do you take? The Māori and Pacific cultural context. So we know that for Indigenous peoples that they um, often have 50% of the biodiversity. They are at the community front line facing the climate impacts. How do you ensure that their needs are understood, represented, that they are leaders and can be empowered through this? a great question i can take a shot at it uh rosalie yeah i mean we all know the pacific and island communities uh have a very very unique cultural context and close ties to the land and, and i think two things have really helped uh, one is of course just being part of the fellowship uh, i think over the last four years and our strong exposure to the whole uh, maori context has been super helpful it also helps that a couple of us have lived and grown up in india which is I think very similar sensitivities in, in ethos in many ways in terms of relationship to the land and the rivers. Uh, that said, I think the first principles here would be that any project must really start by respecting local customs, traditions, um, the governing structures which are already in place and sort of meaningful uh, engagement with the communities. And I think neighborhoods there could be a big one for us. Um, and we have a whole sort of host of uh, knowledge within the fellowship in terms of the work, for example, what Amy has done in building resilient communities uh, to lean on. And I, the last thing I would say is like co-designing solutions that leverage traditional knowledge versus trying to sort of redo everything from the start. So in several ways, back ideas that uh, design with the community and not sort of throw in top-down ideas uh, would be crucial, I feel. Uh, you're on mute, Rosalie, I think. Apologies. So if we're talking about the, the fund, you're at the point of structuring it. You've also talked and you mentioned the Satya um, going into an accelerator. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you're hoping to achieve through that? So the CPI Lab is a global innovation uh, uh, platform or uh, incubator uh, so um, here, you know, what they do is, you know, uh, when we come with an idea, which is not fully baked, uh, and they they have a, a lot of experts in policy and finance, and they, uh, CPI helps in um, uh, stress testing the idea, make it robust, and uh, uh, then, uh, you know, um, the fund design, the governance structures, all those are uh, uh, formalized. And once, uh, you know, a CPI a lab endorses the project, then you have their network of uh, uh, partners, which are governments, uh, corporate uh, uh, foundations like uh, uh, Rockefeller, Exxon foundations, you know, all these people, there are 60 major uh, investors and uh, philanthropic funds, which are part of this, including countries. So uh, you know, they are the uh, sources for uh, uh, the catalytic capital and the concessional finance that uh, you know, can be raised for this uh, climate fund. Thank you. So um, I'm just conscious of uh, time. Um, we do have time for one more question. So uh, from Robert O'Brien, to what extent do metrics play in these financing approaches? 
And how do you see measurement capabilities in grassroots communities being developed? Um, if important, expanding the theme of metrics, how do you think we might represent or surface the interdependency found in worldviews? So this is really about the metrics and measures of value that can actually uh, support any sort of blended or regenerative finance models. I'll take a models. shot at that. Uh... Thank you. Uh, just checking if Sid uh, wants to oh. share some of the neighborhood. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, I, I think this... Um, kind of like Robert, I think you've almost answered the question yourself, like some of the intelligence that you find in communities that are so close to the land. Um, projects like ours are almost backing that they want to lean into this wisdom. And the question is, are they willing to use toolkits and, and technologies like us? Can we make it simple enough to use? in a way in which they can formalize and create these systems that are useful for them. Um, projects like the Z, the ZDP at Stanford, along with some of the allied projects in the Sri Lanka project, um, are hoping to create like intelligence on the sidelines, which can be shared with such communities. Um, but ultimately, the, the key is, you know, I, I think a lot of these communities understand what it what species diversity truly means on the ground. They understand what seed diversity might mean on the ground. They understand what regenerative practices actually mean, and they and you know they've been practicing for thousands of years. Um, and so we think there's a lot of support, almost facilitating this intelligence to just be to be tracked within these communities. And so the role of climap almost will be to follow some of the, this context and the wisdom in these contexts in order to support it, as opposed to playing that role of like, let us tell you what is the best way to in, you know, regenerate and increase biodiversity in these regions. Um, it feels like, um, yeah, just a simplistic answer given the time, but I'll, but so that's I'll, the, I'll the general click, quickly add to that. Uh, you know, we also, uh, Sid, you know, the neighborhoods platform is excellent for capturing all this social and environmental impacts, but we also use some formalized tools de developed by other gurus in uh, investment field, like the RISE Fund. Uh, you know, they have this impact multiple of money. So those kind of tools can be uh, used for investment decisions. And of course, the Impact Hive also has, uh, is, is, you know, uh, built on similar tools for making these impact decisions. Satya, thank you. And just conscious of time, we've we've just got a couple of minutes left. There's one very quick point of clarification. Thank you, Cheryl, which is, is that this really focused on small island Asia Pacific nations, or does it also include Aotearoa New Zealand as well? A uh, quick answer is uh, no, uh, it doesn't include the New Zealand. The focus will be uh, Asia Pacific uh, Islands, because that is to uh, have the impact focus, and that is for defining uh, to the uh, investors into the uh, fund. Um, so, but if we are able to organize uh, the fund structure, and if there are separate streams, you know, it may be possible for uh, New Zealand projects. But, but the startups in New Zealand, which focus on the Pacific Islands, the technologies, climate technologies, which have relevance for the Pacific Islands, those kind of startups can be a part of that Im impact hive, like whether it is Kiwi, uh, Kiwi Fiber or M Melan's uh, project of, uh, you know, the um, hydrogen, uh, generating hydrogen from organic waste or Tim Moore's project, you know, of compressed air for refrigeration and cooling. So those kind of technologies, projects can be supported. Listen, thank you all so much um, for this. And just so that we can be clear, your ask here is for help in helping to shape and continuing to structure this, uh, connections into funds, ideas for projects and the support structures. Is that a fair summary or have I missed anything? No, oh, that's a perfect summary, Rosalie. Thank you so much for that call to action. Yeah. 
So look, we thank you. And I just want to give a very heartfelt thank to Sid and Satya and Vishal, both for the passion and energy that they've brought to this, but also just being willing to share this at a stage and to open it up, knowing that, of course, we do not have all of the answers, but there is something that is really powerful here. And we will look for opportunities to also bring the impact hive model. This is something that has been worked on. It's not easy to explain in just a couple of minutes. So I think there is opportunity for follow up for those of you who are interested. So thank you so much, all of you, for your time and for joining us today. And I'll hand back now to Michelle. Yeah. Thank you, um, yeah, Sid, Satya, Vishal and Rosalie for the session, the conversation. Um, we went into detail and very wide and it is really exciting to see just what is the potential and the opportunity from here. Um, so just a quick question to everyone before we sign off is what is one key takeaway or insight that you are taking from this session? So just have a think about that, um, thinking what we have explored here, what is one key takeaway or insight you are taking from this session, and then we will close with a karakia. Kia hora te mareno, kia whakapapa ponamo te moana, he hua rahi ma tato e te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato ia tato katoa. Kia ora, thank you everybody.